Welcome to today's webinar, uh, Winning at Sustainable Food Packaging, How to Eliminate Toxic Chemicals to Drive a Safer Future and a Stronger Business. We're very happy to have you with us today. I'm Joanna Anderson, the Director of Learning and Member Engagement at the Sustainable Purchasing Leadership Council. I'm going to uh, start us off with a quick introduction and uh, housekeeping items on the next slide, please. Uh, as we've been commenting in the chat, uh, you have the option to put your questions in the Q&A box, uh, which should be available in your Zoom panel at the bottom of your window. Uh, you can also chat with us and with other participants in the chat area. Um, and um, we may have this feature enabled. And <laughs> if, if you need some help from the host, you can also just message the hosts and panelists. Uh, just a quick note that this session is being recorded and we will email the recording out to all registrants. Next, please. All right, I'd like to take a moment quickly to uh, run through today's speakers who will also introduce themselves um, when we get to their section. Uh, but going in the order of pictures, uh, we have Justin Boucher, Operations Director with the Food Packaging Forum Foundation. We have Judy Paneos, Senior Director of Sustainability and Supply Management at Sodexo. Stacy Glass, Co-Founder and Executive Director of Chem Forward. And Boma Brown West, Director EDF Plus Business for the Environmental Defense Fund. Really great lineup today. And uh, you're gonna hear some about some great tools that are available from these organizations. Next, please. So quick walkthrough of the agenda, uh, just a quick introduction of who we are, who's hosting today's webinar uh, and why we're hosting it. Um, then we'll talk a bit more about why we should care about chemicals and packaging, uh, and then a deeper walkthrough of our pathway to safer packaging. And we'll leave plenty of time for questions and discussions. So as we noted, please put those questions into the Q&A box uh, at any point through today's session and we can get to them towards the end. Next, please. So today's webinar is hosted by the Single Use Materials Decelerator, which is a cross-sector collaboration of scientists, food industry professionals and NGOs with a shared vision of a world where food service providers and food brands use packaging without negative impacts on human health and the environment. And all of today's panelists are active contributors to the Sun Decelerator. So we support science-based evaluations of different foodware and food packaging options, which are compared with each other for their diverse impacts on environment and human health. We translate complex scientific concepts into actionable knowledge uh, to support protection of human health and the environment through developing web-based and freely accessible tools and informational materials that can be easily used by non-expert business audiences. Next slide, please. So to support that vision and mission, the Sum Decelerator created the Upscore card, which supports science-based purchasing decisions for foodware and packaging. And you'll hear a lot more about this free tool later today, uh, specifically regarding its unique approach to chemicals of concern. And we invite you to check out the tool via the web link at the bottom of the screen or the QR code on the page. Next, please. Great, so that's the very quick intro. Uh, I'd love to uh, um, hand over now to Justin Boucher from Food Packaging Forum to talk about the health reasons. Thanks, Joanna, for the introduction. Yep, like Joanna said, my name is Justin. I work at the Food Packaging Forum. We are a nonprofit and independent uh, research and communication organization based in Zurich, Switzerland. And we focus on gathering and summarizing and distributing all the latest science related to um, chemicals in food contact materials and how it affects human and environmental health and also environmental impacts of food packaging. If we could go to the next slide. So um, I think it's pretty clear for all of us here that food packaging needs to be safe and sustainable, but in order to have truly safe food packaging, we need to know the chemical composition of the materials used to make our foodware and our food packaging. And in this first part, I'd like to just take a few minutes to share with you what the latest scientific research over the past few years has shown about the chemicals used in food packaging and some of the health reasons, first off, that we should all think about and reasons we should care about the chemicals to begin with. If we could go to the next slide. 
So a couple of years ago, we at the Food Packaging Forum developed and released what's known as the Food Contact Chemicals Database. Uh, it found that over 12,000 different chemicals are known to potentially be used worldwide in the manufacture of all different types of food contact materials and articles. And there's an open access study that you can see about this on your screen that you can read. And you can also download and search the entire database of chemicals for yourself if you're interested. Important to note is that these 12,000 chemicals are just the ones known to be intentionally added in food packaging. And research has shown that there are still many, many more chemicals that can be present unintentionally in foodware and food packaging, such as reaction byproducts and impurities. If we could go to the next slide. And a key challenge with having so many chemicals present in food packaging is that uh, they can move from the packaging into the food we eat. At least many of them can. And this is a process known as chemical migration that's illustrated here on the screen for a block of cheese. But so far, there hasn't been any kind of systematic overview to show which chemicals are really studied to be present in food contact materials and which one of those actually migrate or move from the packaging into the food and then potentially expose consumers who eat that food. If we could go to the next slide. So to help provide such an overview that's needed, we at the Food Packaging Forum really recently put together the first ever systematic evidence map of all the chemicals that have been scientifically measured to be present in or migrate from food packaging into food. And we found that over 1,500 different chemicals have been measured in published studies to migrate from different types of packaging into food. And similarly, you can learn more about uh, this research in an open access scientific study shown here on the screen. And maybe more interesting is that we built a free interactive tool that you can use to explore all of the underlying data for yourself and really drill down into what the data says about each of these chemicals, what materials they're used in, and which one of them have been measured to migrate. If we can go to the next slide. So all of these thousands of scientific studies show us that many different chemicals can be present in food packaging and that many of them can also move from the packaging into the food and expose consumers. And the resulting problem really with this is that we also know that many of these chemicals are hazardous to human and environmental health in many different ways. Um, and some examples of the research have shown that some chemicals are linked to cancers, developmental damage during infancy, obesity, diabetes, um, loss of IQ points within society, and many others, as are just a few examples. And you might be asking yourself right now, so, but why should I worry, right? Because our government agencies like the US FDA or the European Commission in Europe take care of this already and ensure that only safe chemicals are actually present in food packaging, right? The answer is unfortunately no, that's not the case currently. And an overview of all the current gaps in the regulations right now are included in a 2020 consensus statement that's shown on the right side of the screen that was put together and published by a group of 33 international scientific experts from universities and consumer health organizations. And that statement was also supported by uh, an additional statement signed by over 200 environmental groups calling for action to better address this. So in the statement, for example, scientists explain that current regulatory practices don't consider the reality of endocrine disrupting chemicals in food packaging or for the chemicals that can have higher effects when we're exposed to them at low or lower concentrations. And current regulations also don't take into account our real exposure to mixtures of chemicals through food packaging, which has been shown to have potentially greater health impacts than when we're exposed to each chemical individually. And like I said before, there's also many chemicals that are unintentionally present in food packaging, and these are known as NIOS, and they're not yet being systematically checked for their safety within current regulations. If we can go to the next slide. So within the EPSCoR card, we work to pull together all the latest science to help you stay ahead of current regulation and start to address some of these current chemical safety gaps that exist in food packaging. And specifically, we put together a set of priority chemicals that you can look to start to address. And these are known in the EPSCoR card as chemicals of concern or COCs, as you'll often see in the tool or on the website. Um, Informed by authoritative bodies like the European Chemicals Agency and the World Health Organization, a chemical of concern here in the EPS scorecard is defined as a chemical that has been identified 
with one or more of the hazard properties shown here on the screen. And that includes chemicals scientifically linked to causing cancer, um, disrupting the hormone system in our bodies, being persistent in the environment or in our bodies, being able to accumulate in our bodies or in wildlife, or having some and or having some kind of um, toxic effect on humans or wildlife. And BOMA is going to go into a bit more detail about this metric that's used in the tool a bit later. But that was just a quick introduction to some of the health reasons why we should be caring about the chemicals and food packaging. And I'm going to turn it over now to Judy, who's going to share a bit more with you about some of the business reasons that make chemicals worthwhile to uh, carefully think about as well. Thank you, Justin. Uh, so welcome. I'm glad you're all here. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Judy Pineas with Sodexo. But like all of us on this panel, I'm involved in the Sum Decelerator, as well as uh, my other hats that I wear as board chair for Sustainable Purchasing Leadership Council, board of the Global Sustainable Seafood Initiative. But today I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about what I do at my day job, which is responsible sourcing at Sodexo. So I'm gonna offer you the food service perspective to chemicals and food packaging. Next slide, please. So let me give you a little bit of context. At Sodexo, we have our corporate social responsibility roadmap uh, that has been based on the materiality of what's important for us to address uh, at our organization when it comes to the CSR perspective. So when we think about our uh, corporate responsibility roadmap, we, are, we think about our impacts and our roles. So our impacts are on individuals, on communities, and on the environment. And our roles are, we are an employer, a service provider and a corporate citizen. So we think about our this holistic approach to um, what is important to us from a corporate social responsibility perspective. And we've now translated that into our global responsible sourcing strategy that incorporates three pillars. And what's interesting is that chemicals touches all three. Now, very directly, the health and well being aspect, it's a direct impact to individuals. Uh, when we think about social equity, if these chemicals find their way into the environment, impacts on underserved populations happen more intensely. And then in the natural ecosystems, of course, once those chemicals are in the environment, we've, we've changed that environment and it can affect biodiversity, it can affect um, uh, our water systems, a variety of aspects that, that are detrimental, once again, to human health, back to that health and well-being. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, slide, please. So I'm gonna zoom a little bit into this health and well-being. When we think about safety at Sodexo, uh, and we, as a food service provider, we go beyond regulation, right? To Justin's point, Regulation doesn't cover everything. We're going to take a zero harm approach. And that applies to food safety and chemical residues that could make their way into what we're serving our, our customers, right? It's that impact on consumers that's so important that we as an organization are paying attention to. Uh, and we think about not only that food packaging that goes around the products that are coming in our back door on the ingredients that we're, we're getting from our suppliers, but also those non-food materials and services. So if you look at the safe, safe food materials and service, non-foods, uh, non-food materials and services, it's that packaging that we're buying to deliver that food to the end consumer, whether it's a reusable or disposable, and we don't want any unintentional consequences of, of things that are migrating to the food, correct? So when we think about how important that is, we wanna take this holistic approach to circularity. If we've got a circular solution around our packaging, but it leads to an impact on individuals directly or the environment to indirectly impact individuals, it's not viable as it leads to unintentional consequences and it doesn't protect those for, uh, in our supply, in our um, value chain from that uh, zero harm approach. So the question is, how do you action this, 
right? So how do we incorporate this into procurement, into my role in responsible sourcing? And it can't be done alone. If we just spec the heck out of everything we buy and we tell our, our suppliers they have to do this, uh, without addressing the systemic issues, we end up pricing ourselves out of the market. And of course, if we can't continue to do good in this market by staying alive financially, we can't, uh, we can't make the positive differences that we want to. So we can't do this alone. We need to influence our entire supply chain to change and standardizing through working with experts, many of whom are on the call, multi-stakeholder platforms, and developing these common tools that we can all start using, that's what's going to really influence the market and change how things are designed, manufactured, and delivered so that we're protecting uh, individuals in the end. And speaking of experts, I am now going to pass off to Boma Brown West of EDF to cover information about the pathway to safer packaging. Off to you, Boma. Hi, everyone. I'm Boma Brown West. I am a director of EDF Plus Business at Environmental Defense Fund, which is an environmental nonprofit um, committed to building a vital earth for everyone. I'm gonna kick off the next part of the discussion. And so now we've walked through the compelling health and business reasons to commit to safer packaging, but how do companies set those commitments and turn them into real action? This question can feel even more daunting when we realize that the toxic chemicals problem isn't just about what's in the final packaging, but also encompasses all the different <clears throat> packaging and other food contact materials that touch food from farm to shelf. Some chemicals of concern are added to final packaging, like PFAS applied as a grease, grease proofing agent on a paper takeout bowl. But some can also be used in materials used earlier in the food manufacturing process, like perchlorate used as an anti-static agent in super sacks to transport ingredients around a food plant. So today we're gonna to walk through a holistic chemicals management process that will set you on the path towards safer packaging. There are three key steps to this path. Eliminating known chemicals of concern, but if you stop here, you can only confidently make free of claims about your packaging. Steps two, find safer alternatives, and three, purchase safer, help you move into the more confident position of making safer claims about your packaging. So let's go ahead and start with step one, which is eliminating known chemicals of concern. The first step in the process helps you identify, understand, and remove known problems that may be lurking in your food packaging. Eliminating known chemicals of concern proactively helps you lower cost and time to respond to disclosure requests, gives you confidence in complying with increasing regulations and customer demands, and overall helps you reduce risk. To get started, it's important to understand your universe of chemicals of concern. As Justin mentioned earlier, there are over 12,000 different chemicals that can be used in food contact materials or their manufacturing. So using our definition of a chemical of concern as explained earlier, the sum decelerator, which is again, a cross industry group of leading food service companies, NGOs and technical experts created the food chemicals of concern list, a first of its kind harmonized list of chemicals of concern for the food industry that guides users away from known hazards in food contact materials. Leveraging research and market validated information, this list includes chemicals that should be eliminated from intentional use across food processing, food packaging, and food service. Chemicals are grouped into a progressive path where tier one presents a short list of chemicals of concern to avoid, and tiers two and three build on one another, providing more extensive and more protective lists. This list can be used across the food value chain to provide consistent and aligned messages of chemicals to avoid in all food packaging. Regarding your own safer packaging program, this list can also serve as a communication tool to your suppliers of the required level of performance 
tier one and aspirational levels, tiers two and tier three for your company to be able to achieve the free of claims that you want from your packaging. It can also help you set expectations about disclosure and verification. But one may also ask, can I further prioritize where to concentrate efforts in my own portfolio? Or even if I want to test to verify what's there, where should I focus my resources? Knowing the universe of chemicals of concern you're dealing with is one thing, and prioritizing where to act first is another crucial step. Ideally, you want to set the food chemicals of concern list as a signal to your suppliers of what you don't want in your packaging going forward. But how do you gain a baseline understanding of what's in use in your packaging today and where you need to concentrate resources for reduction and elimination? When prioritizing where to act, it's important to evaluate what materials are used at scale across your business and what chemicals of concern are ubiquitous in those materials. Two new tools may help you prioritize the packaging materials and associated chemicals of concern that need your attention first. The first one created by Food Packaging Forum was referenced earlier in today's webinar. It's an, inter it's an interactive database where you can discover specific chemicals that have migrated out of different types of food packaging materials and into food. It's a great synthesis of years of scientific research across the globe and gives you a sense of known and unknown chemicals that have been detected in a variety of food packaging materials. The second resource, one second. Yep. The second resource uh, is a new interactive visual map created by EDIA that helps you connect specific toxic chemicals on the food chemicals of concern list to the specific packaging products and materials they're used in or appear in including insights from packaging professionals about what's intentionally in use today, this tool helps companies go straight to what chemicals matter most for the food containers and associated packaging materials used in their own portfolios. You can drill down from something like a multi-material plastic pouch or a paperboard container into the various underlying base materials and auxiliary materials and additives like inks, coatings, and adhesives and finally, to the toxic chemicals involved in their manufacture. So after adopting the harmonized food chemicals of concern list and digging into what chemicals of concern are most relevant for your business to tackle first, next comes kickstarting your elimination strategy, which may involve a mix of approaches such as structured surveying of suppliers about intentional use of the food chemicals of concern, requiring full packaging ingredient disclosures from suppliers or spot testing packaging materials. You can also incorporate the UP scorecard into your process. The UP scorecard is a science-based online tool that measures the environmental performance of commonly used foodware and food packaging materials with a single yardstick. It's a useful way to see how the different material options for common foodware compare along key metrics from climate to chemicals of concern, all at once. The chemicals of concern score for a material takes into account the material's inertness and default expected presence of chemicals of concern. <clears throat> As you, and it, the score ranges from a two to 20 in the scorecard. And as you engage your suppliers to understand your existing portfolio and track what you're learning, this tool is one way to start understanding how your packaging portfolio relates to generic packaging materials. And it's also a useful tool for seeing how improving the chemicals of concern score of a material can improve its, the material's summary score and its ranking against other materials. To do this, simply click to customize the material and adjust its chemical of concern present score to capture when the material is free of chemicals in one or more of the food chemicals of concern list tiers. You can also evaluate the impact that the quality of supplier declaration has on the material score, because the score will increase when you move from relying on self-reporting by a supplier to third-party verification from say an external auditor or a testing laboratory. To conclude, effective elimination of toxic chemicals starts with adopting the food chemicals of concern list, prioritizing action on the tier one chemicals and or the most prevalent chemicals and materials in your portfolio, and kickstarting a strategy to gain disclosure and reductions and eliminations from suppliers. 
while also fully integrating of chemicals or your approach to chemicals into your overall approach to sustainable packaging. With any of the resources that I've covered today, eliminating toxic chemicals from your packaging can become an easier endeavor. And now I'll turn it over to Stacy to talk about the next step in the pathway, identifying safer alternatives. Thank you, Boma. You laid a great foundation for us and I'll try to build on that on our pathway to, to safer chemistry. My name is Stacy Glass and I'm a co-founder and executive director of Chem Forward. We are a science-based nonprofit organization working in collaboration with industry to create broad access to chemical hazard data and with an emphasis on safer alternatives. Next slide, please. In our journey to safer chemistry, as Boma so um, eloquently described, screening against chemicals of concern, restricted substance lists, lists authoritative lists, uh, is the very first step. It's cost effective, it's fast, and it's something that everybody can do to get on that path to safer chemistry. The next step, though, is really understanding what chemicals you are using. The, the screening is what not to use. What do you use instead? And to do that, we need chemical hazard assessments. But those have been historically um, expensive, um, inconsistent, housed on private systems, and it's really slowed our transition to safer chemistry. Next slide, please. What is a chemical hazard assessment? I use this, our, my co-founder Lauren Hine often says it takes a lot more information to prove that a chemical is inherently safe than it does to prove that it's toxic. We might know that something is carcinogenic or a sensitizer and not appropriate uh, for a specific application. And you can stop there, you don't have to go any further. But to say that a chemical is safe, we need to look at all of the human and environmental endpoints and make sure we understand that there's low concern on all of those fronts. And this work is done by a toxicologist. Um, it's, uh, it's time consuming, there's expert opinion involved. And so that's why this is so difficult um, uh, and expensive to get a, a data set on this. And that's why we're working to have a shared data set. I loved it when Judy said earlier, that you know, this is more than any one company can do alone. And to truly work towards safer chemistry, we need shared tools and shared resources. And that's what we're building here. Next slide, please. And so um, building off of uh, this graphic we've been using throughout, when we looked at how do we find safer alternatives, there were a few barriers in the system. We needed to lower the cost and improve the data quality and consistency. And for that, we needed to build a shared repository of hazard data and safer alternatives. Another barrier kind of taking that, so at the pure chemical level beyond that is actually verifying um, safer claims. You know, companies in the supply chain here, they don't buy theoretically pure substances by cast number, they buy Dow, BASF, Eastman's version of whatever. And so um, assessing and verifying those things by trade names is, a, is, a, is where we ultimately need to go. Next slide, please. And so um, we wanted to look at how might we scale the availability of safer chemicals and the availability of trade name uh, chemicals for use in safer products. And we found this great example you may be familiar with, the US EPA's Safer Choice label on the, on the far right side here. This is something that brands use to communicate to consumers, to communicate to buyers that this product has been fully disclosed, uh, fully evaluated, and it is indeed a safer choice. And that's exactly what's needed for buyers, whether it be a consumer or commercial procurement. They need a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Is this good? Um, should I use it or not? But building up to that, we need these other resources that we mentioned. So on the far left, the US EPA has a skill list, the safer chemicals ingredient list. And these are chemicals that have been fully evaluated chemical hazard assessment and have been proven to be of low concern. And they indicate that by a full green circle, a half green circle or a yellow triangle. And that list is publicly available. It's a great place to start, right? Everybody's got this uh, positive list or green list, if you will, to start with. Then uh, formulators and manufacturers can use those to then get their trade names approved. And those are housed in a repository called Cleangredients that's hosted by Green Blue. 
And all of those clean ingredients can then be confidently used by brands to put into their final product and they will qualify for the safer choice label. So what this really does is create this pull through effect where there's something in it for everybody in the supply chain to be able to market and, and show that they do indeed have safer chemicals all based on the same data set. Um, which, which means that we can have confidence um, in that. So what we loved about this is the pull through strategy and that there's something in it for everybody. And so next slide, please. How do we replicate this in packaging? We partnered with the Sustainable Packaging Coalition over the last year and convened the Safe and Circular Materials Collaborative to one, say what, what areas should we focus on? And immediately we focused on uh, plastic additives for mechanical recycling and possibly chemical recycling, uh, knowing that if we improve the additives uh, that we will improve that feedstock. And then similarly for paper and pulp, the PFAS free additives, great that it's, it's uh, PFAS free, but what is it? Let's assess it and make sure it's safe. Then can we identify and assess uh, uh, safer alternatives and eventually develop this cloud-based registry um, like, like the clean ingredients model? Next slide, please. And so over the course of the year, uh, we did indeed uh, start to put these pieces together. And later this year, you'll see um, an output uh, from the group. So we've started with this repository of chemical hazard data and safer alternatives. That's the Chem Forward data set. And uh, in the next slide, I'm gonna show you, you can get some free access to a slice of that data. Then we created the safer uh, designation. That's sort of that middle ground for trade names to get their chemicals evaluated and, and verified that they are indeed safer. And those will be housed in the Sustainable Packaging Coalition's Clean Package Registry, again, coming out later this year. And we expect that all of those resources will roll up into various meaningful certifications like the green screen uh, certification or the cradle to cradle certification and maybe even others so that there, we can create that pull through in the supply chain. Next slide, please. So a uh, slice of the data that we've been able to, to use as a demonstration project is on plastic additives. And you can use this QR code uh, to go and uh, get access to that. There's about 1100 chemicals, about 200 safer alternatives in there. And our goal here is really to support concurrent chemical management strategies so that you can rapidly identify and eliminate the chemicals of concern like BOMA was, was referring to find safer alternatives to, to make informed substitutions, and hopefully prefer chemicals that are fully assessed are shown to have low hazards. So next slide, please. I'll just take you through a couple of quick things here. This is what it looks like uh, when you create a login. You can search by chemical name, CAS number, or EC number. And notice that left-hand navigation, you've got function, material compatibility, but also um, the food contact, uh, um, the FCCD, FCCDB that Justin mentioned earlier. So you can cross-reference by, is this intentionally added in food? And also the food uh, chemicals of concern um, is in there. So you can, again, uh, further filter by that. Next slide, please. And what you'll receive is some um, kind of interpreted and actionable high level information. A, B, C's are considered safer. There's something going on with those C's. So we want you to dig into that a little bit and make sure it's appropriate for your application. And F is high hazard. And we want you to move away from those. And the question mark is there's not enough data. We, this is a known plasticizer. This is a known whatever, but there's not enough information. And if you need to use this chemical, you should probably seek a chemical hazard assessment on that. Next slide, please. And so again, just wanted to show you if you choose function, a long list of uh, plastic additive functions will come up. I chose plasticizers here. Next slide, please. And what comes up is a list of plasticizers in order from better um, to worst. And uh, there, there's a, a hundred and some in there. And I wanna also draw your attention over to the right-hand side where there'll be a little yellow triangle. If this, if a certain chemical, sure it's a C, which is safer, but um, this has been noted of, of concern on many lists, including the, the SUMD scorecard uh, tier two um, and the chemical footprint project and some other things. And so that just might bring your awareness to, well, you know, it's, it is a C, there is still some concern with it and you'll want to dig deeper into that. 
So with that, I'll invite you to, to you know, come on in and take a look and play around with that. And there's good guidance in there on how to use the tool. And I hope that that gets you on the path to finding safer alternatives. And with that, I'll turn it over to Joanna Anderson and she can describe how to purchase safer alternatives. Great, thanks, Stacy. So again, I'm Joanna Anderson, Director of Learning and Member Engagement at the SPLC. I, I neglected to mention that I am also the current president of the SUMD group. So I'm um, excited to be here today to, um, uh, in both of those capacities. Next slide, please. So at the SPLC, we work with large institutional purchasers to buy goods and services that are more sustainable. And since our founding, we've really focused on simplifying and standardizing sustainable procurement for both purchasers and suppliers. We really understand that purchasers hold significant purchasing power to drive market transformation. And we also recognize that suppliers can respond much more efficiently and effectively when they're receiving clear market signals. So uh, with that in mind, um, we know that our community of purchasers uh, are increasingly being asked to support the sustainability goals of their organizations. Uh, so we're looking for ways to support them in purchasing safer options because sustainability is not just environmental. Uh, we're very interested in addressing the impacts to people and considering environmental justice. We know that circularity is a really big topic right now uh, and that we can't have a circular economy without safer products. And we also know that uh, given the focus on climate, uh, there's been uh, increasing examination of a connection between climate and chemicals. So, um, so with that in mind, the SPLC has been working on finding ways to support purchasers in implementing a safer chemical strategy. Next slide, please. So uh, to do that, we created a Safer Chemicals Toolkit for purchasers. Uh, just like uh, the majority of the resources that we offer at the SPLC, our focus is on providing purchasers with the resources that they need to do their job. So uh, we have in this toolkit sets of fact sheets that I'll, I'll highlight a bit more in just a moment. But these are, are intended to communicate information both clearly and succinctly uh, in terms that purchasers can understand and utilize. Uh, we also include a set of model specifications in these toolkits. Again, going back to the idea that suppliers can transition to safer materials uh, when they get that clear market signal, rather than fielding a bunch of different messages. If they know that a large portion of their customers are demanding safer chemicals in their products, then they can make that change. So these, these specifications are intended to have harmonization in the approach. We also offer case studies uh, of various institutions that have been implementing different safer chemicals approaches. Webinars uh, like this one will be in our webinar library uh, and uh, various tools uh, that can keep purchasers moving forward towards their goals. So all of these resources, this toolkit uh, is meant to support a few different things that we know are critical to sustainable procurement success. The first is supporting internal engagement. Uh, whether you are a purchaser who is looking to grow a, a safer chemical strategy within your procurement organization and need to get buy-in from your CPO, uh, or if you're a sustainability professional who's working with purchasers to build a strategy, uh, these materials can help you get the buy-in that you need for success. These resources really will also support supplier development. Um, so we know that uh, we have to have strong partnerships with suppliers in order to both meet our business need and our overall sustainability goals. So these resources can uh, support you in developing some trainings, uh, or facilitate engagement uh, that will bring suppliers up to speed. And then lastly, that focus on specifications for the standardization to send clear market signals. Next slide, please. So the centerpiece of our Safer Chemicals Toolkit is a set of simple fact sheets that cover five different categories of spend. Foodware, uh, which is our focus today, but also cleaning products, furnishings, electronics, and paints and coatings. These were the five categories of spend 
uh, that were identified as the most relevant to our audience. So um, these fact sheets get to the most important points right away, the key impacts and chemicals of concern associated with the category, links to the model specifications, uh, lists of relevant certifications that make it easier uh, to identify verified sustainable products. So Stacy hinted at that uh, in one of her last slides there. Those certifications are incredibly helpful in terms of evaluating products in a more efficient manner. Uh, these fact sheets are currently being tested by our Safer Chemicals Learning Circle. Um, so they're being used to support their own organizational Safer Chemicals goals, um, but also to provide us with feedback that we need to improve the toolkit for better support for purchasers. If you are a purchasing organization on today's call, um, you're invited to join the pilot and you would receive full access for, uh, to these resources. Next slide, please. And one way to, to do this is to attend our June 15th deep dive. Uh, the SPLC hosts a series of deep dives and our second one is very relevant to today's audience on procurement to accelerate the safer chemicals revolution. Uh, so in addition to a really great keynote and panel, Boma and Stacy from today's panel are going to dig more deeply into the tools they presented today. Uh, and the SPLC team uh, will discuss the Safer Chemicals Toolkit and invite uh, participants to either review the materials and provide feedback or to participate in the full pilot, testing out the, the fact sheets in various settings uh, and then providing feedback to us. So you can check out uh, that event via the link at the bottom or the QR code uh, and definitely can reach out to me with any questions on that. Next slide, please. So now we've walked through the full pathway to effective chemicals management from eliminating known chemicals of concern, finding safer alternatives, and ultimately purchasing safer. Uh, so now we would love to answer questions that you might have about the concepts that were shared or the resources and tools that uh, we've made available. Stacy's going to lead us through the questions. Thanks, Joanna. Yeah, that was fantastic. And I'm, I'll start with directing one first to Justin that came in early on. It's a little bit long, Justin, but you'll, you'll get the gist here. What specifically about the current existing policy landscape allows for hazardous or toxic chemicals to be used in food contact applications? Put another way, shouldn't the burden of proof be on the producer to ensure that the chemicals or materials used in food contact packaging are innocuous or benign. Instead, it seems the current approach puts the burden on regulators and individuals to deduce the potential risk and harms, which seems to result in regulatory efforts being constantly behind the curve, the sort of whack-a-mole approach as new chemical formulations are developed. Can you speak to that a little bit, Justin? What's, what's broken in our system? Yeah, sure. So this 2020 study that came out from this group of 33 scientists and then was signed on with a uh, an additional consensus statement from these 200 international groups, they pointed out that the, the current regulations don't take into account um, a few things. One is the fact that there are many, many chemicals we're exposed to at once, so mixtures. And we know that chemicals when mixed together can have what are called sometimes additive effects, that they produce more impacts on human health as a group than they would if we were exposed to them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and we also know that there's a lot of chemicals that are migrating into food packaging that we don't know anything about. And an interesting result that came from our, our FCC MIGEX database study is that um, two thirds of the chemicals that were, that were detected there were not previously known to us in the wider list of all the different packaging chemicals that were intentionally used. So there's a lot of things that are being detected in this packaging that weren't on the radar before for use in food packaging at all. And, and that's, that's already a red flag to say that something's missing when we don't think the regulators are even aware of these chemicals being present in food, these food packaging materials that do migrate into food and expose consumers. And regarding the question about the burden of the work, it's a good question. Um, in, in Europe, at least uh, under the, the, REACH reg, the REACH legislation, the concept is exactly as the, the person asked that industry should be responsible for proving the safety of um, all of the chemicals in the products they sell to consumers. 
But when we know that there's so many additional chemicals that we weren't even aware of being present and that aren't even on the radar to be discussed, uh, it means it's, it's, it's somehow not working that way and, and the system's not operating like it was intended to. And so there's, there's some, some work that needs to be done to improve the regulations. And in the meantime, um, there's tools like the ones we presented in the UP scorecard to try to encourage people to take a first step ahead of the regulators who sometimes um, seem to do be playing this catch up game. Do any of the other panelists have anything to add to Justin's comments? Thanks so much, Justin. That was very helpful. Uh, next question. And um, I'm going to, um, this might be Boma, Judy, um, in your realm a little bit. How likely is, uh, excuse me, let me start over again. How likely is it that chemicals that are added to food packaging today have similar effects to BPA? Since we caught BPA relatively quickly, wouldn't we see similar effects from a chemical that's just as harmful much faster today? So how, I, I think this is getting at a regrettable substitution. Are we in as much risk as we used to be? Will we identify that sooner? Maybe Boma, you wanna start with that and Judy, see if you have anything to add in. Sure, yeah, I'll go ahead and start. And um, I will say, I mean, I think we have already seen um, effects of regrettable substitution in the case of BPA, right? In terms of movement to um, others in the bisphenol family, um, in particular BPS. Um, I think that in terms of the speed to identify and root out um, chemicals of concern before they become um, prevalent across the marketplace, um, the root of the issue is transparency, right? Not knowing what is being used next. And I think if um, you're to get anything from this webinar today, there is a through line of trying to of trying to enhance the transparency across the supply chain so that companies all along know what's in use and are able to also communicate the qualities of the chemicals that they don't want in uh, their future food packaging and the qualities that they, that they do want. Um, I, I feel like that's gonna be the first major step in being able to try to prevent regrettable substitutions in the future and also root out um, existing issues today. Um, I, I, again, I think it goes back to transparency and greater greater visibility. Uh, Judy, did you want to add anything to that too? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it gets into this space that you, that we've illustrated here is that free from from is we, yeah, of course we have to you know things that we know are bad. Let's get rid of them, but it has to be in that safer space, right? We have to move there and it's collective action like the different groups that have been mentioned that are creating these tools, that are disseminating these tools, that are working together um, uh, with purchasers, right? Like me across uh, everyone. So, so that we have that those market, the, those market signals to the manufacturers all the way back to, you know, people creating the chemicals. Uh, if we don't, we don't continue to try to standardize the, the dialogue, um, we'll never get that transparency. Uh, and we will keep getting unintentional consequences, right? I mean, gosh, you know, how much com compostable uh, food service ware has been implemented over the years uh, because it was more, it was more circular and it was better for the environment and it avoided plastic uh, microplastics, but yet then we're coating it with this stuff, um, right, that hurts people. So um, we really need to get into that safer space. And, and it is going to be through collective action, uh, like, uh, like the work that, that we've been outlining here. Thanks, Judy. The next question kind of builds on what you were saying. And, and uh, one of our attendees is asking, how can we get suppliers and producers to disclose what chemicals are used in their packaging? And, and I'll, I'll, I'll start with Judy, but I'll invite um, um, others to, to weigh in too. Yeah, and it's funny because you know, if you're a big purchaser and uh, you're a desirable customer, um, you can get some real detailed information. Um, but it, it, it can be a real challenge, right? And, and if you, 
uh, and you're going to get resistance. I, I come from med device, and when it when you talk about chemicals of concern in my my previous job uh, in med device, it was really highly regulated, particularly in Europe. But then there were these long lists, right? And and so it, this was you know 15 years ago. We're pushing our suppliers to give us just give us the full makeup of what you've got. Give us the the full thing. We don't have to keep coming back to you every time something new is added to a list. And you know, it, it took a long time to, to get that kind of disclosure and transparency. And, and that was extremely regulated when it comes to, to med device. So I think we just have to keep asking um, all of us, right, to get into this space of this safer. And uh, and if, if a lot of us in a purchasing space, we don't know it, it's all the chemicals and everything uh, to ask, right? So we need to partner with experts. We need to partner with groups who are gonna help us ask the same questions in a meaningful way to, to the market so that um, behaviors are changed. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add on this that um, some of the certifications um, and, and the reason that we started a raw materials designation for SAFER was because the, the secret sauce, the confidential business information in many of these suppliers, especially with these innovative PFAS free um, uh, solutions. And so the, the programs, some of the certifications allow for disclosure to a third party confidentially it gets fully assessed and then receives that safer designation from Chem Forward or a certification from Green Screener or Cradle to Cradle. And that's one way that we can get disclosure while still protecting confidential business information. That's not the ideal solution. Full transparency is the ideal solution, but it certainly will get us get us there. Panelists, uh, anything to add? Oh, Judy, I'm, please. I, I'm gonna push one, one more thing. Let's go even further. Let's talk yeah. open source, right? I mean, you have some people starting to work in this space when it comes to safety. Was it Volvo who did it with seatbelts, right? They like did, so, they, they've had a safer solution and they just gave it to the world, right? Like, how do you, how do you encourage that kind of behavior so that we're acting pre-competitively? Uh, in, when it comes to protecting people. Mm -hmm. Any additions from the panelists? I think uh, since this is the main space that we work in, in terms of uh, supporting purchasers and uh, driving transparency, I just say that if we don't keep asking uh, the question, then nothing's ever gonna change. And that's really, um, that's really what we set out to do. So if it's a space where there isn't a huge uptake yet because the certification is new and there aren't a lot of certified products. Uh, you can choose to uh, just signal that you're, you know, to your suppliers that you are moving in that direction. And then once there's more products available in the marketplace, you can give a preference to suppliers that achieve that certification or that disclose fully the materials that are in their products. And then ultimately over time, once you've uh, walked through those steps, you can require it because the market is there, the products are available, suppliers are disclosing. Uh, so don't be intimidated if you feel like, oh, they're not gonna give me anything or there's no products that will meet this spec. Um, start taking uh, the first step by signaling and then preferring so that uh, when the market is fully there, you can, you can make that change. It's a journey. That's a great point, Joanna. Uh, we've got a question here um, that gets at uh, the chemical companies. Is there a greenwashing version by the petrochemical industry? And how do you combat the mighty chemical lobbyists? And I'll just, I'll kick this off and then invite, invite you. I'll say what we're trying to do with Chem Forward is invite the good stuff to come forward and be assessed so that we can amplify and share the good stuff. And um, there's many other groups that are, that are helping to find the bad stuff. Um, but other, other perspectives on the chemical industry and- you just have to keep at it, mm -hmm. right? I, I mean, I, of course there's people hiding stuff. There's all kinds of papers out there, all kinds of research saying, so many things have been hidden over the years around climate, of course, with chemicals, pollution, you name it. 
right? But if we don't keep asking, if we don't keep as purchasers putting our, our money where our, our mouth is, right? Um, and, and we're we're not gonna get that change. Well, and one thing I'd say uh, is that the, that's what the UPSCORE card is intending to do. It's based on science uh, across a set of impacts. So chemicals of concern being a really robust area that I think a lot of other tools don't cover. Um, but you, 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 are, you are assessing different materials, different products across those metrics, and you'll be able to see, you know, so if, if there's a claim that a product is better from a climate perspective or from a chemicals perspective, uh, you can validate that uh, by using that tool. We have two very technical questions uh, left. Uh, Justin, I'm gonna see if you can answer this and maybe this is a follow-up for someone, but um, is it widely published that PFAS substances are ubiquitous in the environment? So there is a background level, right? No matter what, no matter what we do. When you use the phrase free from, what level of detection are you referring to? Any thoughts on that, Justin? Yeah, so the up scorecard's pretty clear about how this is interpreted for the chemicals of concern metric. And that is free from means you don't intentionally add these chemicals into your product. And PFAS is a, a good example of how um, they can be in the background. We know that packaging manufacturers, many of them are, they're really struggling right now, trying to weed out where PFAS is used all along their assembly lines and really get down to really low levels in their product. And it's a big effort for them right now. Um, and with PFAS, a lot of the measurements measure what's called total organic fluorine. So they're just looking for that fluorine molecule, which exists in PFAS chemicals, but also in other chemicals and also in the environment. So there's a common limit that's being discussed right now, which is 20 parts per million. And anything that's above this is considered to be a sign that PFAS was most likely intentionally added and therefore you cannot apply this free from claim. And so I, I just wanted to add there, um, taking that into account companies, that's a way to really start, as we have been talking earlier, about examining your portfolio and what's being used in your portfolio, using threshold limits like that as a way of being able to, if you're detecting PFAS, for example, or other type of chemicals, using that as a way to try and um, um, you know, determine whether something has been intentionally added to the packaging product. But another important thing that Justin said there is that it's not just, in many cases, it's not just about what's in that final product, but all the different places along the supply chain where food is coming into contact with different materials. And so to have a really robust chemicals management strategy, um, one has to think about that entire supply chain and um, examine that entire supply chain, which we understand it's not, that's not a trivial thing to do, um, but uh, it's one of the main activities that has to be done to really start addressing um, the use of these chemicals or the intentional, the, wherever they're intentionally used. Great, with that, we've got one minute left. There's one technical question remaining about finding um, uh, tensile strength increasers for bioplastics. And I wanna say, um, first try the free um, uh, plastic additives optimization tool, search by function, um, it might give you some hot leads there. And I'll, I'll put this uh, to our group and see if we can and do any uh, meaningful follow-up by email on that question. Do you wanna wrap it up, Joanna? Great. Yes. Thanks so much to everyone for joining today. Uh, we hope that uh, you found the tools and resources and information useful. Um, and thank you to all of today's panelists. You all are doing such amazing work and happy to be collaborating with you. And we will um, do a follow-up email with the recording uh, and the links to the different resources that we shared with you. Feel free to follow up with any questions after that and have a lovely day, everybody.